Well, welcome back to another episode of Postmortem Radio. I am your host, Oz, and joined by my esteemed colleagues. First, the blonde in front, Katie. How are we doing tonight? Excellent, excellent. Excellent, good, good. And we got JK. How How's it going, doing? everybody? Uh, good, very busy, a lot going on, and uh, very blessed. I hear you, I hear you. All right. Well, uh, tonight we are going to do a double uh, episode again. Um, last one was kind of fun that we did. Uh, the Evil Dead Rise and Sisu, I think. Was that the, that was the last double we did or did we do another one before that? Since that? No, I think that was the that last was the, one. That was the last double I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. But this one, I, I've really been anxious to see, to talk about this one a little bit more because this first one. Uh, because when we did our top five, this one was definitely in our my my top five of thus far of uh, of 2023. So, uh, and we're going to be talking about Cobweb. This one, uh, I I was lucky enough to see. Uh, I think it's available on streaming now. Um, so uh, October 23rd. You can you can watch it on Apple. Uh, it's it's, I, it's, it's uh, on you Vudu, can see so you can see it on Vudu. Mm -hmm. It's Google Play, Apple TV, yeah. Them. Um, but uh, yeah, this one uh, I really, I really enjoyed this. One. Um, but uh, before we like really dive deep into, it, Katie usually. Oh no, I'm sorry. We're, we're you're going to go last. Um, I can discuss what the movie is, but then I'll do okay. my review last. Okay, yeah, let's do that because you do such, you always do such a great job of like putting it in a little package and you know, kind of giving us, you know, the overall just, uh, you know, premise of the movie and all that kind of good stuff. And then, and then we give our uh, opinions, whether they're warranted or anybody cares or whether they don't care, we give them that. So we'll hand it over to you, Katie. And uh... All right. Uh, Cobweb is directed by Samuel Bowden and written by Chris uh, Thomas Devlin. It stars Woody Norman as Peter. You may recognize him if you watched The Last Voyage of the Demeter. Uh, he is a little boy. He has his parents, uh, Carol and Mark. Uh, they live in a house. I know that doesn't sound like it's anything, but um, live in a house with pumpkins in the backyard. Uh, you know, it's just a very Americana little opening and the four words, the week before Halloween. Uh, mom and dad put Peter to bed, and while he's in bed, he hears whispers in the walls. He freaks out. Mom and dad, it's like, oh, Peter, you have such a vivid imagination. Never stop that. Oh, it's very 1940s, 1930s. Like, oh, I love your brain. I don't know why I'm talking like this, but I am, which I'm like, <laughs> okay, I don't know. That seemed very Hitchcockian, the way the mom spoke like that, which I love. Mom is played by Lizzie Kaplan. Ma, love her. Um, dad is Anthony Starr, who many will know from The Boys. He's got dark hair. Love him. Um, and yeah, just as the movie unfolds, you realize um, school isn't that great for him. He gets bullied, it seems like, by everybody. I don't feel like he has any friends. He has a substitute teacher. I want to point this out. A substitute teacher. This is someone who has only known him again. This is the week before Halloween. That is seven days. This substitute teacher has only met, known him for maybe three or two before she decides to make a house call to his parents. Yeah. Gonna have a lot to say um, when I do mm -hmm. my review. Uh, but yeah. The more the film goes, the more the whisper in the wall, you know, come, um, is speaking to Peter and stuff like that. You see the tension at home and then a lot of stuff happens. Uh, yeah. Jay and Oz, why don't you give us your review? Um, I will say I thought that uh, there are a number of the aesthetics in the house that I thought were very uh pleasing i love um i love the cast i thought they were amazing i thought the music um was um pretty chilling and stuff like that it had a number of a lot of a number of jump scares a, a lot of like little 
tips the hat, I thought, to other horror films, which I'll discuss um, a little bit later and stuff like that. But yeah, um, I'll let Oz and Jay tell you what they're thinking, and then I will destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jay, you want to go first or you want? Well, to be honest, I had to shake the cobwebs out to be able to remember this film, to be honest. I knew a little bit too. Stuff. Yes. So, you know, one of the problems with films which I really enjoyed cobweb uh, or cobwebs I should say it's it's a fun Halloween type film it's not reinventing the wheel by any stretch of the imagination right. it's pulling from a whole bunch of different things which I'll let Katie talk about because I know that you know there was some I named when we first saw this and um, that Oz had named and I'm sure Katie's going to name some influences that I didn't even think about which is what makes this show so great because there's three different perspectives with it. And we, we tend to trail off of each other and we tend to find new grounds and stuff like that, which is awesome. Nonetheless, um, I enjoyed this film. I really did. Um, having Kevin Gruitt, the one of the co-editors, which usually is a problem. Um, I didn't feel as much was a problem with this film. Kevin Gruitt, if you don't know him, uh, saw a franchise. He's a big factor as a director and a, uh, editor for the Saw franchise, but he's done so many films in the last 10 to 15 years of modern horror. Some that have been successful, some that have not been. Uh, nonetheless, he Samuel Golden is joined by a very talented DP who's uh, shot a lot of mainstream films, big budget films, which I think benefits this film greatly. If you go into the film, honestly, um, Lizzie Kaplan talking like she does, Katie, it's not a surprise whatsoever. She sounds like that in every movie that you listen to Lizzie Kaplan in, just about. And if you find one that's not there, you know, then I, I'll, I'll buy you a beer, okay? Because everyone is that, that, that I, I don't even know how to put that dialect. You know, they say Anton Chigar from No Country for Old Men is the dialect and in in how uh, if you were from hell it would sound. Well, Lizzie Kaplan, maybe that's from hell how she would sound. So with that being said, um, the cast is good. The cast is good. The cast is fun. Anthony Starr is like a sore thumb in this movie. There is no reason why Anthony Starr should be in this film other than maybe name recognition for it. It takes away actually from the overall horror. And spoiler alert, um, it's pretty simple to figure out once you start putting the pieces the first 10 minutes of the film. And I think Katie's going to have a lot to say about that, how the simplicity of that with it, getting to know her as I have over the, the uh, years. Um, it's something that definitely reflects 1980s horror. So if you're looking for a film that's got the aesthetics, the acting chops, the scares, the, the formula, this is your film for you. Now, it doesn't take away, and I'm not normally a fan of 1980s horror. I like 1980s horror. I don't sit there and drool like certain people I know drool over 1980s horror. They know who they are on this call right now. Um, I don't tend to drool over it like a lot of people do. But I did enjoy this film. I had the chance to watch it on the screener and do a review for Horror Hound, which it was really cool to be able to do. And I did recommend it to Oz. And I think Oz and I both agree we did enjoy this. It was a lot of fun yeah. to watch. You know, you're not looking, this isn't, well, I don't know if you could say the latest A24 masterpiece because a lot of people are uh, questioning A24 with some of their horror releases. But nonetheless, it's definitely a film. If you want to have a Halloween fright, you want a good date movie where your date will get closer to you and you can try and make a move. Not like these crazy parents that are in this house from the people under the stairs. <coughs> Sorry. You know, it's definitely a fun film to do. The soundtrack is great. Very unusual combo who would handle the music for it. Uh, but it still reflects that period of horror. Um, I won't give away the ending because I think it, it's a fun ending. I don't necessarily know if I agree with the design of what the ending is, but I definitely think, hell, I love Katie right now because that's how normally I am. I appreciate that so much, Katie. Um, but I definitely think it's a fun film. It's not, again, not reinventing the wheel. The kid actor is good. Um, you know, Lizzie Kaplan is what it is. She plays, she's probably the best character of this. And I can't help but agree with Katie. Cleopatra Coleman, the substitute teacher, poor casting. 
the hot substitute teacher that really doesn't it, it, it just doesn't make sense, folks. I'm sorry. But I'll get more into it as Katie starts to rip it apart because I'm sure I will pull things out and go back and forth with her on it, which is rip good. Apart, rip apart. Do By it, the way, know, Cloverfield, Cloverfield and Mean Girls, you owe me a beer. Oh, stop. She's so like that in Cloverfield. Mean Girls, maybe not, but Cloverfield, she's a whiner. Okay, so she's got that whiny voice. There you go. I owe her half a beer. I like that. I'll, I'll get you a Bud Light. There you go. Ew, God, <laughs> yuck. Well, we're talking about this film, and I think this is reflects what your taste is for this film, so it works. Uh, no, if you're going to do that, then you need to get me, like, a pumpkin ale. Uh, oh, dun, dun, dun. oh, thank you. Thank you. By the way, the Oktoberfest beer from Sam Adams is absolutely delicious. Highly recommend it. Be a sponsor if you're hearing this. Go ahead, Oz. You're up. All right. Uh, like, like you, Jay, I... It's it's been a bit since I've seen this movie, so um, yeah, it may not be the most fresh in my in my head uh, at this point. But I do remember it, I, I really did enjoy it. Thought I thought the acting was pretty good. Um, the performances were were pretty spot on. Um, I really liked Woody, uh, who played Peter. I thought he was uh, I thought he was really really good. Lizzie Kaplan I thought played it, it was. She did such a good job of playing someone who's just mentally just unraveled and just batshit crazy, really. Um, but then you kind of find out maybe, you know, towards the, you know, end of the film, you find out that, well, maybe they're not quite as batshit crazy as you think they were when certain things are revealed and certain, uh, certain plot points have become realized um i thought i thought what i really i really loved the production design of the house and the walls and the, and the intricacy of the house and everything where he he you know how, how they would get through every place in the house through the walls and stuff like that i thought that was really i thought that was really cool it was very dark it was very gritty um so i kind of i really enjoyed that I thought I thought the score was for the, the the music was really added to that creep factor. So there was that, and I did like that they, you know, as far as the girl in the wall, you know, they it kind of reminded me of Jaws a little bit because you don't you don't see her, they don't show you the monster for a while, um, and then you know. So it's 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 more impactful when you do see it. Um, there are some head scratching things, like you guys alluded to with the substitute teacher, uh, not knowing the kid. I mean, I even during the movie looked over at Janelle and was like, "Would can you see a teacher at our kids' school coming around like within a couple of days?" Especially if I mean, if it was something with the kids' behavior, maybe. But I mean, I think. You know, probably more often than not, they would probably just call the cops and send the cops over. I don't think they would. I mean, it was it was almost like she cared so much about Peter. And I'm not trying to fault teachers for caring about their students whatsoever. But to this degree, it almost it was that almost added another level of creepy to it. Like, why is she so interested in this kid, you know, and what's going on in his home life and all this stuff? I mean, I I get that they under that they care to a point, but they, he's not the only student she's got. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I just that that part just didn't feel. I I will. Ha I'm gonna, I want to interject on that. When you do look at the other students, though, I mean, uh, spoiler alert, and part of my French, but I mean, those kids are assholes. I mean, not most kids that is a classroom full of little shits so the fact yeah. that peter is actually one of the more decent children that is yeah but god i mean but this right, was but my, yeah, this is my birth control film of the well, year i i will say this real quick <laughs> that's a good way to put it let me let me put this out there real quick and again this goes back to the editing i have a feeling i could be wrong i have a feeling the backstory of why she cares so much was left on the cutting room floor in favor of the 1980 horror frights and the very emotional core of the story of this child and what he's going through at home and why he is being tortured. Okay. 
moving on. Yeah, I, I still think, you know, they took it to way more of an extreme than most teachers. I mean, teachers just can't pop up at people's houses like that. I mean, just. Listen, this is when teachers cared, okay? Especially ones with no backstory whatsoever coming into it. Although it has to be modern. She has a cell phone. So it's a modern story. Yeah, it can't be in the 70s. Let yeah. Me, let, me, let me look at the date. Give me a second. I'll tell you what, what if they give a date on it. Hold on. Good. So continue, Oz. Go ahead. Um, That's that's pretty much, you know, the that was the biggest thing to me. Um, I didn't have as big a uh, issue with Anthony Starr. Um, I actually thought he, the especially the way they dressed him and made him look, to me, it it spelled out like a nod to hit to Psycho. He looked like Norman Bates to me in this movie. I mean, I don't know. He That's... acts like Norman. He acts. He is always going to be classified as Homelander until his career is over. That's why he looks like Norman Bates because well, he is Homelander in this film. Well, and he looked so different than when you see him on The Boys, but um, I think it was the beard because I think he at first I thought he was Scott Speedman. And I was like, man, that's that's <laughs> but um I like I that. think we talked about this before. He's also in the uh the covenant with the yes. he's in that with uh Jake Gyllenhaal, which which was also another another great movie. Um but uh I don't know. I mean I, I enjoyed this film and I the only other thing that really kind of I was kind of didn't understand was if this if this if this person's like living on Scrap. Spoiler! Spoiler alert! Yeah, spoiler spoiler alert. Yes, lots of spoilers. If spoiler alert! Living in the walls, eating scraps and and insects and or whatever. I mean, I'm 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 really I don't understand how she ends up having superhuman strength. That's I mean I, I don't know. Uh, that, that you, was kind of a scratcher to me. Have you looked at the design of her? It's kind of a little more than that. I'm just saying. So it's, it's, uh, Katie, why don't you go? All right. So I will tell you why I dislike this film so vehemently. And it starts with the four words, the week before Halloween, because this, this entire film encompasses seven days that means as much as we like peter and feel so sorry for him this little shit is so susceptible to some voice in the walls that he does what he does he caught he maims a freaking kid and then does something even worse than that in seven freaking days for someone who lives in his walls let me tell you another reason why I dislike this film so much. So much. Uh, there's always things with films that if there's like a hidden person, if there's this or that, then this. There's sight, sound, touch. But I always go with the senses. Sight, sound, touch. Uh, no. Shit, what are the other two? No. Taste. Taste. No. And then the one that would give this away, smell. That chick is living in a wall for at least 15 years. And there's a hole that he can see her through. He would have smelled her years before that, let alone now. And Oz, what you were saying, I mean, um, she gets fed. She gets fed. Um, It's not that she's only eating like insects. She gets fed by, um, you know, uh, Carol. Which again doesn't make much sense when um, stuff happens at the end, but it's also the fact that mom, who's Lizzie Kaplan, seems to have more of an assertive tone at the beginning of the film, and then all of a sudden it splits, and it's like she's the domesticated wife. Oh, I used to be a teacher, but now I just live on this abandoned pumpkin farm that happens to be in my backyard. And it's Halloween, but we have 50 freaking pumpkins that no one has come and asked us for, which I thought was stupid. I thought that was stupid. This is a neighborhood, and you've got a freaking pumpkin farm in the back that he refers to as a garden. 
Why did you change it? You saw it. It's right there. <laughs> I'm I'm get I'm doing the deodorant sponsor for the girl. Uh huh. Um, the garden, <laughs> the garden in the back. They have to get rid of the pumpkins. I'm like, garden. You've got a freaking pumpkin farm in your backyard. It's Halloween. What do you guys do for a living? Like, I don't understand. And it's the fact that it's like, it seemed like, I don't know, if it hadn't had the week before Halloween, and this had been encompassing like a number of months, I could kind of see the buildup because it seems like it definitely doesn't seem like Peter just started getting bullied. Um, That seems to have no. been gone up, but it escalated to like that little evil Busey that, you know, Gary, Gary's that's not Jake Busey's uh, son, by the way. That is Gary Busey's son. So he's got a teeny baby, Luke little baby Gary Busey. Son? That is Gary's son, oh, wow. not Jake. Yeah. Um, and the fact that I don't know, there's just so many things about this. And then they do this whole thing how it's like, oh, you know, someone, um, why what does that say? Not sure why. <laughs> We are getting so upset over this. Because I had I paid to watch it. <laughs> hey, I pay to watch all of them. Yeah. Well, when I pay to watch them, I get mad because this is a way I thought this was a waste of money. That's because you um, see but, and free. I thought it also um it had a number of things like let the right one in, the Swedish version, with you know, you know, crawling on stuff like that and flying around, which was okay. I don't even understand. There's a uh, there's definitely some super, supernatural things that also I feel like yeah this is definitely edited um it a lot should have I don't know the whole they week before Halloween lot. seven days this isn't the ring it should have been over like a number of months to like at least give that kid somewhat more of a reason to do what he ended up doing and i don't feel like he's the hero of this story well he's a freaking uh, patsy <laughs> katie i'm going to throw something out there and this is a problem with horror films this is a big problem it's been a big problem for a long 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 time and this is where i'm going to actually defend the 1980s here's something for you folks out there don't fall down okay the 1980s horror films 1970s, 1960s, they knew their identity and they knew their lane. They were blood, boobs, and gore for the most part. That's what they were. That's what 19, that's why most people, mostly men, love it because that's what the core of horror pre-1990s is. In the 90s, all of a sudden, things started to get smart or and elevated. And meta, yeah. And meta, starting with Scream. If uh -huh. you want to blame one of the films for that, you blame Scream for that. Because what happened is that film started to get more complicated. Well, that's a problem because not everyone likes complicated horror. They like blood, guts, boobs, and scares. That's what this film has a lot of. And pumpkins, obviously, that they can't sell. Lots so of damn that, pumpkins. <laughs> lots of, which is blocking the smell because yeah, the they pumpkins the pumpkin, smell they terrible. pumpkins in place of the boobs. It's, oh, there you go. Oh, nice. I like that. All about so, the round. All about the all about the round. <laughs> oh, the there curve. you go. That's, and and obviously the detailed paintwork. All right. So getting back to what I was saying, what happened now and what's happened over the last 30 plus years is that horror now is become more evolved in storytelling. The problem is that a lot of people don't want to see evolved storytelling, especially during Halloween. Most people don't. So when they get the final film, guess what the editors do? What film are we going to make? Well, the producers say we have to make this because we have these stars on the cover. It's got this kind of scare factors. So any emotional core that this kid's going through, the only reason why he's bullied is because this makes him the protagonist. Not because he's emotionally scarred. This substitute teacher is a side character, is the most side character can be. We've got these two star names in the parent roles. That's all that matters. It makes a formula for a film that is one-dimensional. And yeah. that's a problem with a lot of horror, especially... When, you're, when you plan to sell it to Walmart, when you plan to put it on VOD, you plan to make it a big push with a lot of these minor studios and distribution houses because they want content. And I'll tell you what, anyone out there who has a really experimental idea, guess what? Your idea is going to be butchered up into little pieces most likely because it's too much for most people who are fans of horror pre-1990s to be able to handle. 
So that is why this this film, Katie is exactly right in a lot of what she's saying. I enjoyed it. It's a fun film, but I understand exactly what it is. I am not taking it too serious, unlike my other two comrades here who are freaking out over women in walls and smell of pumpkins and what deodorant they're wearing and why they're being bullied and why a really hot substitute teacher is really there. You could have put anyone in that role. But the point is, there's a reason why, because we're horror fans. And this, to a certain extent, as much as it is a popcorn horror film, there is not nothing more to it. And we're wasting our money on it. Wait till you hear my review for The Nun 2. Oh, oh, yeah. My thing is like, you've got the whole, I mean, and it is, I feel like the substitute teacher caring so much about that student, they go to their house is becoming uh, the new trope of horror that happened in Antlers. It happened here. I feel like it's happened on another one. And usually the substitute teacher ends up getting killed. But this one, it's like, I'm going to save this child, you know, all this stuff. I've only known him for a day. And yet I know something's wrong. Uh, but yeah, it had like uh, your next, let the right one in. Um, people under the stairs. People under the stairs, majorly. But In I the do, stairs. Well, and um, what is it? Uh, something of 84. The, what's Summer the of 84. Of Summer 84. 84. Summer 84. I feel like if they were going to do something with the end, I really wish it would have been more like the summer of 84. And I'm yeah. going to spoil, 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 because that ending to me was nothing. I would have liked to have seen him like in a, um, uh, what is it? Fragile. God, I'm sorry. I'm messing up names and movies, but like years down the line where he's like, just been like, is a shrivel of a man because, um, he's been waiting and waiting and waiting and he never knows what's going to happen because, you know of what is promised to him at the end of the film. I personally would have liked, I think that would have been more effective to see like, you know, even if he doesn't die, um, just the fact that he hasn't been able to live because his entire life has just been like waiting for whatever supposed has been promised for him to happen. I think that was a miss that really could have gone a long way, but yeah, I I mean, the practical effects were um, pretty damn good. There's a number of, you know, uh, heads chopped off, a lot of things going on with the, um, you know, when you've got the huge climax at the end. But yeah, I would say this is definitely my birth control film of the year. I mean, just that classroom in the beginning without any words, like Peter just sitting there at his desk with all the kids throwing themselves like, yep. Nope. Mm -mm. So that's me. I say pass. Oh, uh, I disagree. I think I think it's a fun film to see for Halloween. Technically, technically, with the sound, with the visuals, with the aesthetic production line. If you're looking for something very basic without much of a story, but you want to have fun with it, got some frights, you need a, a date movie. This is a perfect date movie during the Halloween season. Katie is taking this a little bit. She's a little upset. I, I think she's trying it. I had a lot of high hopes from you guys. Well, I, I won't lie. I won't lie to you. I, I still stand by it. It's worth seeing. But you know what? It's a, it's a, everyone's different, you know? Don't turn into Lizzie Kaplan, please. That's all I'm asking you to do, Katie. Don't turn to Lizzie Kaplan. Um, oh, Jay. You're so funny. <laughs> um, what I was going to say, though, is, yeah, this is just a fun movie. You want to see a good VOD movie? For Halloween, you want to see something that's got that Halloween feel to it, you know, you, and you don't have to use too many brain cells, then Cobwebs is the film for you. I will say for Halloween, because that's the thing. Yes. I saw it in that's perfect. August, July, just, yeah. yeah. So Halloween. It's a one and done. Me, yeah. I'm done. Yeah. yeah I had and more faults and pluses. I think too having having see it you know as a parent as well you know as you know having children and I I kind of like was able to put myself like God what would I do if I was in that situation with my own kid you know what I mean so um, I think that also maybe adds, adds a little bit of a, a layer to it um, because I do contrary to what Jay but yes I do love eighties horror but I do also like to have you know. 
uh, be stimulated uh, mentally, you know, sometimes when I'm watching films. So, oh, Oz, I'm so joking that, with you, Oz. That, uh, that I thought was kind of cool to, to, to be able to kind of, you know, be like, wow. You know, I can't imagine. You know, Doing that. Oz, that's one thing I I want to I want to compliment you on because that's a perspective that neither Katie or I can come from. When is that? I can come from the educational component. I can tell you that very few teachers I know would do anything like that. So yes, that that's more reality. But what I do love about Oz, what you said, is the fact of how terrible these parents are, and that's one thing the film doesn't hide from you. They don't try and make these parents out to be good no. parents. Even in the beginning where you say, oh, this might be this or it might be that, they don't make it out. They cast, you know, they do a good job casting Homelander as a dad and Lizzie Kaplan as, as a, basically uh, a, a Mrs. Bates. That's that's basically what she is when it comes to it. So, yeah, so you can have fun with that also, looking how terrible the parents are, because that's another element that this film, I believe, gets very right. See, and I almost... I don't know. I <laughs> because but this would be a spoiler. It's like uh it it would be a spoiler and I almost think that there's a number of factors with the parents that um make them somewhat Here's the thing, I just don't feel like Peter is the protagonist in this film. I really don't. I feel like I mean, I understand he's supposed to be we're supposed to feel sorry for him and he's the anti-hero and not really an anti-hero but just all the things he's going through at school and you know his family is strict there's no beating there's no this it is there is a scene you know where discipline is done that is you know not great uh that's been like in a number of lifetime movies i feel like uh but when there's like also that. a second yeah there's also a second factor of it that you then realize at the end and i mean they are parents and i'm gonna this is gonna be a spoiler when i say this but you know i i got i just thought about this there's a little bit of sophie's choice in there too yeah, uh that's so what I was gonna say. They, they're, there's they a little have bit of like sophie's an... choice so i mean what do you do like, I mean, are they necessarily bad parents for what they're doing to Peter or <laughs> when you look at the alternative, it's like what they have done before Peter was born and stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. That's a lot That's of a lot tension. Of and, stuff. and I mean, the kid's like 11 years old. So I think, yeah, Peter's supposed to be like 11 years old or stuff like that, even though I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember drawing like that when I was 11 in school. I think it was what, fourth grade, fifth grade. I think we kind of got out of that. Um, but yeah, I see it like that. Like there's the Sophie's choice factor that. They, um, they, yeah, they were, they were, they had an impossible, you know, like. Work. I mean, they're doing the best they could. My thing, I just didn't understand what the hell they did for a living. Cause I thought this was a pumpkin yeah. farm. And then I realized that it's like, wait, are we, why why are there houses next to this what's going on i mean i feel like the state would have or the city would have been called with all that um pumpkins like rotting pumpkins in the backyard i know if this is at my parents house or their neighborhood there yeah the neighborhood watch had been called a long time ago but well yeah. homeowners association would have not been cool with the uh, the pumpkins all over the place again it, it, going way too deep going way too it, deep. exactly i was gonna say two things one I know some people in this horror community that would love to live on a rotting pumpkin farm. Um, and the second thing is that Martin Scorsese now is rolling over and he's not even dead after you bring up Sophie's Choice and compare it to Cobwebs. I'm just saying. Oh, I know. He, oh, I know. He doesn't like Marvel movies. He, I'm sure he's not going to like what you had to say with that, too. Which I do love the fact that um, when he said, you know, um, get rid of... Uh, <laughs> Get rid of comic book movies and support Christopher Nolan films, and yet Christopher Nolan directed three of the uh, exactly. highest comic book films, in which I think he forgot about oh, one, on. which it's won selective. an Oscar or multiple, and the um, Dark Knight, which is the reason why we have ten picks for Best Picture now. So. Right. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Scorsese. <laughs> right. 
Are you, Jay, were you implying that Martin Scorsese listens to the show? I would certainly hope so because he has good taste. That's all I'm going to say. All right. All right. I think we're stepping See? up in the world a little bit. See, now that's going to be clickbait right there. Hashtag Martin Scorsese. Listen now. Yes. All right. Okay. Well, I think that 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 makes it look like you know two two check it outs and and one uh, find something else to do is what it sounds like. Yeah. Go go see Sophie's Choice. Go see Sophie's Choice. See it before you see Cobweb. If you have. <laughs> yes. Well said, Oz. Well said. All right. Well, so that will wrap it up for Cobweb. So we will take a short break and we will be back with. The Nun 2. She's putting her nun outfit on. Okay. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, it's a t-shirt. Okay. I thought you were I thought you were literally gonna put like a nun outfit on. Oh my god, no. <laughs> I got that from the studio. I'm not investing that much in that. That's kind of creepy, Jay. It kind of looks like you are a nun. Yes, outfit. doesn't it? <laughs> Jeez. That is amazing. That is, that's got it. That's got to be the thumbnail. It's gonna have to be the thumbnail. <laughs> oh, geez. All right. Well, the nun two. Um, I actually have not gotten to the theater to see this one. Um, like Jay, uh, things have just been crazy busy and. Hey, we're newlyweds and we've been, you know, going out of town and lots, lots of little road trips here and there and things. So we've not, it, it's been a while since I, I don't know what the last film was I got actually went to see. I can't remember. Uh, but there's lots of movies out that I want to check out. But, but luckily, uh, my two uh, co-hosts can pick up my slack on this one once again. Um, so uh, I, I actually did not even see the first none. So I... I don't know. I, it just didn't. It didn't strike me as something that made me want to check out. It just. I don't know. It just seemed like a creature film with a bunch of jump scares that um, didn't. And I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm not Catholic, so I don't really know a whole lot about nuns. So I mean, I just really. It, was, it just wasn't something that came up on my radar. It looked creepy and all that kind of stuff, and I'm seeing lots of you know, clips and stuff like that. So I feel like I may have seen it, but um Oh, you've seen it before, my friend. Over and over and over again. That's nonsense. Da -da -da. Thank you. None of you listen to Jay. Okay. None of you listen to Jay. <laughs> Holy crow. All right. Well Katie, you want to give us a little bit of a rundown on the nun two? Yes. The Nun 2, sorry, I forgot who directed it. Nun 2, directed by Michael Chavez and written by Ian Goldberg, Richard Nang, and it says others. Sorry, I didn't write this down. Now, Michael Chavez, uh, in The Conjuring, since this is part of The Conjuring uh, category universe, he is actually, I think it says he's actually directed the most of any of them because this is his fourth one. Um, I personally enjoyed this film. I thought I had no, I, um, did I have any like aspirations of what it would be going into it? No, I saw the nun. I had completely forgotten it. Uh, when I went and saw the nun too, I did like, um, and you know, it's one of those things like Valak, um, who is the nun. Uh, I mean, that is honestly one of the scariest characters in horror. Like I remember watching uh, The Conjuring 2, the whole thing with the stupid song and being in England and blah, blah, blah. I thought that was kind of lame. Uh, the Nun though scared the crap out of me. I remember I actually kept my lights on that night. This, this is coming from me. It's not like I first, don't watch- the first one. Yeah, no, 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 that's not The Nun, no. Conjuring 2. Oh, Conjuring 2. Okay. Conjuring 2 has Valak in it. That's okay. the nun that's in the paintings. And it's very clever how you see in Conjuring 2, they have the V-A-L-A-K, like, in the library. So, um, and it, you know, was big enough that it spawned, like Annabelle in um, the uh, Conjuring, it spawned, a, it spawned its own, you know, uh, film. 
I honestly do not remember much about it other than Thaisa Farmiga, who plays Sister Irene, who is the uh, sister of um, Vera. Vera Farmiga, who's in, you know, all the Conjuring films, who I think is great in this. She reprises her role as Sister Irene. Uh, definitely um, gets that manhandling, I um think from the church where it's like okay we're gonna have you do this like well I don't want to do that she's like and you, and they're like mm, we don't care uh we know you have uh some skills in this the other person who was supposed to do it kind of died and that but I mean it starts off with a brutal kill uh definitely uh anybody who I don't know it's one of those things like the people who are the most innocent I feel like get freaking screwed over the most in this film more than any other of the conjuring films i've ever seen i mean there's one character that's like that person did absolutely nothing wrong they were being tormented by these little brats that are in this church and then bam they get um you don't really see much what happens with them uh they uh vera formiga does or not sorry taisa formiga who's um sister irene Kind of does this whole little um, Dan Brown, like, you know, with the um, going around <laughs> Europe. Yeah, you get like that, you know, going around Europe, trying to figure out where um, Valak has, you know, planted their seeds and is taking out the, what looks like kind of the line of, um, which is a saint that is St. Lucy, which that is based on a true story, which I did not know. Um, saints got man that i uh they need just need to do horror films about the saints and all they had to go through like where's that that right there is like horrific enough but um yeah she's doing this um uh little tour around europe to figure out where valak's gonna be next um it was filmed actually in an abandoned church in france the practical effects and the production design i thought were chef's kiss there's a, a number of scenes where some of them have been used in the advertisement where there's like a magazine that it flips over and flips the pages and all the magazines. And then it turns out like they make sure the pages flip and it's like you see like the nun. That was actually done with actual magazines and it almost killed the director. Not actually, but he was like, if we, this is it, if we don't get this, it's done. And I thought it was very effective. There's another scene that's in the church where, I mean, is it expected? Yes. You know, uh, apparition is following a little girl and stuff like that. She sees it on the bottom of the stairs, doors open, and it turns out it's like dust and stuff like that. I thought that was beautiful production design and art design. Uh, I hate bullies in movies where they always have like little girls being assholes. And I really wish they would stop, but I know they won't because... You know, kids are assholes, I guess, but also it's also supposed to be a time when kids are assholes. So, you know, there's that. Um, does it have its fault? Yes. There's kind of a storyline that sort of just goes totally askew and doesn't make much sense, but kind of again in that Dan Brown sort of way. It's like, does this mean that you're supposed to be a descendant of this, which they don't really explain? And I'm trying not to do any spoilers and stuff like that, but for what it's worth, I thought this was a solid sequel, considering that honestly, no one that I know, no one that I know remembers the first one. And this one, I think, is actually more of like just a standalone. I think there, there. I mean, I don't think there are two characters that are from the first one. One being pretty significant in the Conjuring universe because, uh, in the beginning of the Conjuring, they actually talk about and exorcism they do with this character but also there's certain factors then with the conjuring and then with the nun and then with this that don't align so i feel like that's kind of like gone off the rails and stuff like that which i'm a little disappointed in but uh things i love tasa from um, miga's performance i thought she was great i thought storm reed was you know not a bad you know instead of like buddy cop film you got a um buddy nun film and stuff like that um i think that the yeah the production design and artistic design was great cinematography wasn't bad special effects 
actually um, were better than I hoped. And I would recommend seeing this film. I know Jay is definitely not um, going to agree. Like I said, none of you listen to him. Uh, but holy smoke, I was actually impressed by this. And that's the show, folks. All right. Yeah. And that's the show, folks. Everything's been said. We're good. All right. We're out. Okay. That's the end of Mass. Thank you. I think Katie's okay. getting ready to get some smacks on her knuckles with the ruler here. Could be. Could be. So um, looking at this film, I, Katie uh, covered a lot. I mean, she covered a cathedral worth of knowledge when it came to this one. But to be honest with you, you know, I don't hate it as much as people think that I hate it. I, I really don't. Um, I think The Nun 2, and, and honestly, it's a bad sign when they have the greatest evil in the Conjuring universe. Wow, you just cut the legs out on your antagonist. That's wonderful. That's, that's fantastic. So the greatest evil in the Conjuring universe really doesn't uh, garner a lot because the character that Bonnie, uh, what's Bonnie's last name? Bonnie Aarons. Aaron, yes. thank you. I, I was, I was going to say that I would have been close. The character that Bonnie Aarons plays is actually a really good character, and she really embodies that character really well. You know what they do? They, they kind of like, they give her that that in, that injection of nitro, like you see in Fast and the Furious in this movie, where she becomes like super evil nun. And we've seen this before, folks, with with the whole nun exploitation, with the the Catholic Church horror, with the supernatural stuff, the occult stuff. It's not really rediscovering any walls. One, some of the things I like about this film, I really enjoy the cinematography. Using anamorphic lenses really does give that beautiful feel to it. Um, having those practical locations, shooting it in an actual church instead of on a soundstage for a good portion of it. Wonderful, because you've got a beautiful look and aesthetic to this. And, you know, we, if you listen to Cobweb, the, the first part of this episode with Cobweb, is that's one of the things I really enjoyed about that film and how they were able to create that world inside with light, with shadow across the board. And by the way, Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg were producers on Cobwebs. You yes, understand why the parents are the way they are. So getting back to The Nun 2, it really is a really interesting film because, spoiler alert, the way they connect the two films is really smart. Having the fact of the two characters who are really only the remnants from the first film coming forward and having it built through them instead of having another force on the outside come to it. And you don't really discover it until later on on what's going on with it. The child who's a part of this, um, Storm, Storm, Stormy Reed or Storm Reed, whatever her name Storm is. Storm Reed. Storm Reed is a waste of a character. I'm sorry. I don't need the empowering female character to join the empowering female character to be the empowering female characters. This isn't Voltron. We don't need them to form the mighty Morphin power bot. We don't need that, especially against this because this might be an editing choice, but I can tell you she's not needed because she does nothing for me in the film. And that's one of the biggest criticisms I have for this. What, No matter how many times your face turns, Katie, it's not going to change things when it comes to it. Nonetheless, this is a fun film. And this, again, is a one and done Halloween film. It's made $205 million worldwide. Obviously, it has a marketable thing. We'll see The Nun 3 eventually. Uh, another, what, two, three years, because it seems like that's the track for a lot of the Conjuring universe. I myself, though, saw The Nun so long ago, and it really had no impact on me. Good news, Green. they recap they recap everything for you, so you don't have to see the film. Talk about being brain dead and really disrespecting your audiences, because they overdo it. I'm sorry, but they really overdo it. You want to see a fun exorcism film? that balances go see the pope's exorcist with russell crowe <laughs> it is a fun exorcism film and it, yeah, it, it, is. it doesn't carry the scary scary weight of the nun too um but it's just a fun film it's got a russell crowe's a lot of fun in it he's a great choice for it because in his career now he is probably as close to that character as you're gonna get <laughs> but going back to the nun too it's cool with the effects the effects are a lot of fun and and the kills and the effects um, going along with the production design and, and the locations 
really give a great sense of a fear factor. And that's something that I think Cobwebs to a certain extent does also. But having even the promotional material, and God bless the person who cut the trailer, because they knew what they were working with, and they knew how to push the buttons of people watching that trailer. Because that is a fun trailer to watch. And to see that practically done with the magazines, it is a really cool effect. One of the coolest effects that we've seen in quite a while. And to be able to pay it off like it does with the way that scene is shot and cut, with her looking and panning back and the different faces and how the magazines come together, it is really, really cool. And it's worth seeing in the theater. That's one of the things I would say. If you had the chance to see it, it's probably a fun film to see. It has a little bit of mystery. I love the Dan Brown comment, Katie, you say, because, yeah, it's kind of got that little infusion of Dan Brown in it. Thank goodness we don't see Tom Hanks in the nun outfit. I am no. thankful for that after Colonel Parker. Thankfully, he's not taking on other characters very much. <laughs> but it's a fun film. And technically, it's done really well. I mean, the sound is wonderful for it. To see it oh in the theaters, God. there is some great jump moments in it uh, that really got people. I know my Susan, my partner, my fiance, my love, she jumped a couple times. It caught her off guard. I even had one jump in it, which I very rarely have. So hats off yeah, to you guys for doing that. That's it's weird. very rare. Yeah, it's very rare for it. The idea that you had someone also direct someone that is, or direct or continue to direct the franchise like they have was really smart. I mean, you this this director understands what the aesthetic is, the style, the story they're trying to tell. And I'll be honest with you. People ask, The Conjuring or Insidious? I'll take Insidious every day of the week, twice on Sundays. I am not a Conjuring fan I've never been a fan of the franchise. When I have behind go, doesn't really do it for me. I'm sorry. It really doesn't when it comes to the first Conjuring, if you don't know what I'm talking about. Spoiler alert if you haven't watched it 15 years ago. My bad. With that being said, ten. it's uh, 10 years. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. With that being said, it is a fun film to see in the theaters. It's a fun film to watch at home if you have a nice surround sound system to it. And it's definitely... And I, Katie, I think you'll agree with me on this. It's definitely one of the better sequels we've seen in quite a while. I, yes, I, it's, it's actually, yeah. it's actually a prequel though, is it not? Because uh, it, you know, that's that's re Oz, It's a really interesting question because it says because everything I've read says that it's a prequel. No, it's uh, not a prequel. It's a, no, it's a prequel to The Conjuring. Right. It's the sequel to The Nun. Exactly. Oh. That's where it's a little diluted. So, yeah. You know, but it's a good balance, though. I mean, honestly, you understand why they have the flashbacks, even though I think it's really lazy what they've done. But uh, what's her name? Get? I'm going to say Chorizo because I, I I eat the sausage. All the time. Taisa Formiga. Thank you. I, that's why you were that's why you get paid the big bucks, my friend. Um, she is great in her character. I think that Storm Reed holds her back to a little bit of an extent. That is my biggest gripe with this film. OK. I think it's fun. I think it's worth going to see as well. I think technically it's a great film to watch and to see how you can really expand the universe, putting it piece by piece and finding an actual human connection to the demonic side instead of just making someone getting possessed and having to deal with what the ramifications is and doing the exorcism. It's got a nice little personal touch, which I think is a, a wonderful way to execute this story. The Da Vinci Code. That's it. Da Vinci Code. I couldn't think of it. That's why yes. I kept saying Dan Angels Brown. And I'm like, De I Angels and Demons, too. That's another yes. one. And Inferno. <laughs> uh, Inferno. One thing yes. I want to add, too, which I don't know if this is a fall thing, but I love it. Uh, one of the things that I loved about this film is the marketing. Like yes. in Horror Hound, when we were there, they had about a dozen people dressed up head to toe as nuns with black um just cloth over over their face so you didn't see them and it's like people were taking pictures all this stuff at different baseball games you've seen the same thing and that to me is kind of that guerrilla marketing that we saw last year with smile and, and megan what and megan as well yes and megan yep. and i love that i love because we need to get creative you need to get there yeah. you need to get it out sure. in the and it's like people didn't know what it was about. They actually gave a shout out to me that it's like, oh, 
I think the blonde in front, you know, did something in her stories. It's like, she's a horror influencer. And I'm like, it wasn't me, but thanks everybody. I don't know what this is, but okay. But I love that Warner Brothers took the initiative to do that. Because I mean, this is a time when you don't have any cast or crew interviews. They can't promote the film. There isn't a big, yeah. there isn't a big premiere and stuff like that. And that's a smart way to advertise. And I am very glad, by the way, since it's like, I believe the WGA strike has um, pretty they've much. Gotten, yeah, they've got an agreement. So yay, yay, yay for writers. Well, let's hope that SAG is on that way because right now I don't see any, come 2024, 2025, it's going to be real barren, guys. We're going to be like doing a Back lot of indie. winter reviews. <laughs> Back to indie horror, man. That's what we yeah. want. Back to indie. That is true. But no, like Jay said, this honestly is a solid sequel. I I don't remember. Um, and I'm actually glad they had the recap in this one because I really don't remember it. Like, I forgot one of the characters that was in this film that's in the other one. I was like, oh, yeah, he was not that. Okay. All right. Yeah. That would make sense. Sure. When the promotion at Horrorham was insane with how cool it was. It was amazing. Yeah, and that, that's what it, I was going to say, too, is that, you know, it was cool. They weren't just posing for pics, for photos. Right. And stuff and stuff. They were, like, walking around with, like, candles and, like. A whole yeah. altar. A whole yeah. altar for it. Yeah. Wow. Little ducks in a row all going. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. And I hope more studios. I mean. As much as Warner Brothers have had their misses this year, I think this is a solid one. I think that Barbie is a solid one. I mean, when they do their marketing right, they freaking do their marketing right. And this, I think, is one that um, did that very, very well. I mean, well, but like I said, I it's not. I'm not going to say it's one of my top ten horror films of the year. I do think it is. All. It may be one of my top ten sequels of the year right now because i mean there have been some that have it i mean i don't know i actually can't no no the list ones. you got a lot of lists there lady i mean there's a lot of lists there's a lot of lists. <laughs> there's always but a lot of lists i want to throw something out there though and uh -huh. the, you talk about the marketing and katie i'm glad you brought it up because i looked at right now it hasn't even earned 71 million dollars that's a problem for a film that probably had a pretty decent budget, I didn't look up the budget, but it probably had a pretty. You want to look up Katie real quick? I thought you said seventy it was made two hundred and five. No, worldwide two hundred and five. Oh. Seventy one million dollars. That's a film that should have broken a hundred million dollars with all that publicity. So that's a question on whether or not because each film in the Conjuring universe has done well, and and by by budget it probably did well. But the problem is, I don't think it did as well as The Nun or The Conjuring 2 or The Conjuring. The question is, is it fatigue? Is it the fact that people, it's the wrong time when it was released? I mean, it's a big question on whether or not it will, if there will be a Conjuring or a Nun 3. There could very well be, but I got news for you. It's a little disappointing on that factor, and that's something that can't be ignored when it comes to this because... You want to expand that universe, and there's a big question with the ending of it. What happens? You know, I don't think it's spoiling anything to know that there's a battle between good and evil, and what's happening, and will will the nun be there? Will she be back? Won't she be back? What happens with the next one now that that has been kind of rectified? Is it going to be like the Pope's Exorcist, where now she is this female hunter who's going after all these demons? Come on. Well, I do know that The Nun 2, actually, I don't think it has anything to do with its marketing. I think it's got to do with, like, the depletion of people going to the movies right now. Because The Nun 2 was the number one film this past weekend. I know. That's so scary. And, was such and a that's low... the thing. I mean, that's that was its second weekend that it was out. Like, right now, no, it's third. It came out on the 8th. So, yeah, that would be its third weekend it's out. So, this will be second or third. I can't do math. Anyway. Yeah, the um right. so it gross it's gross right now 70 million uh opening weekend was 32 and then worldwide is 205 i think with yep. worldwide i mean 205 i think that's yeah you're gonna get a sequel i mean i yeah, think that's cool. but when does it when does it end when do they milk the cow until the cow is basically shriveled up like we talked about with the boy who should be at the end of cobwebs 
So, I mean, you know. I don't, this is, this is the horror. I mean, honestly, you're, hello, uh, evil dies tonight. When is that? I mean, listen. Evil the, the, have Look. you heard the news about that? Yes, I did hear the news yeah, on that. And speaking of yep. the teat, um, like if we can get off the teat of horror and get some newer ideas and stuff like that, because I love Halloween. I think Halloween is one of my favorite films of all time, let alone horror. I think it is solid film. I also think that there are other, it's, why did we, why, why is it now there's going to be a new ones? And I don't even. Uh, so I, I, people aren't ready to give uh, give up Michael Myers. I uh, I, don't, I feel Michael like Myers. until I don't know like what has to I don't know. I would love to see if there would be like a Michael Jason like what I mean you have like all those things if like there would be a showdown that's, like that's a killer so yeah like a killer showdown killer nightmare um festival and stuff like that and you had michael and freddie and jason and chucky and all those guys like actually come together and see like all right you know what let's have a showdown and let's see who's going to be the final person and then they get all the sequels and they get all the new ones and the rest of you guys we're done we're down well i'll tell you let's what cage match uh, for hound weekend i know who won't be there the nun because she's the biggest evil in the conjuring universe so she's out yeah that's i don't know she's it's like so the dumb. roman she's like the roman reigns of horror is that what you're saying oh no she's more like well i i can't say seth rollins i guess more like the dean ambrose because he's stuck in aew just saying i will say this i the reason why i love the conjuring is one reason because i did see that in the theater and I, I mean, there is a scare in there. You know it's coming. It's not like it's original. And yet I freaking jumped because everyone around me, it was that communal captive audience feel that you just don't get. And it's one of those things like I do, like the Conjuring movies, they do have, they do have that going for them. Like if you get like an actual crowd of people who love horror films or get freaked out, that can really get those feelings going. It's like, see, I'm not freaked out, but now you're freaking me out. So now I'm freaked out. So stop freaking me out. Um, but I love Insidious. I think Insidious is great. I haven't seen the new one. Uh, but yeah, I Conjuring is always going to have a little piece of my heart. Conjuring 2, no, other than The Nun. Valak was my favorite part of Conjuring 2. Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how they make the sequel. Ready? And we're popping up the picture. In three, two, one, bring them back. Oh, yeah, that would be good. Bring them well, back. Well, now that he's done with Insidious, I mean, it's time for him to come back. And Aquaman. Oh, just saying who's in Oh, that. that's right. Yeah. Yeah, because who knows Aquaman where that's going to. I mean, I would say they would have been starting Aquaman 3, but no. I have a sinking feeling on that. I'm just saying. Oh. <laughs> Oh, oh, the punny. You're so punny. You're so Praise punny. my jokes. Praise my jokes. Thank you. Oh, so, the dad jokes. The dad jokes. Well, I, if I'm like uh, the dad from Cobwebs, not so much. All right. Well, yeah. Okay, fine. Don't hold your breath about Aquaman 3. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I will say one thing. You know, it, it wasn't on my list. You, you guys kind of got me. I gotta, I gotta admit, you guys kind of got me wanting to see it a little bit now. To, it sounds like you guys are both saying it's definitely better than the first one, since you can't even. Yeah, I mean, I can't remember the first one, but I honestly, I think it's a solid horror film this year. Right. Yeah, I would agree. I'll have to put it on the list and check it out. So it sounds like we got two thumbs up and and one who's willing to uh, try to try to get there to see it. Whether I get there while it's still in the theaters or not, I don't know. We'll see. If it hadn't been number one last weekend, I would say it would be gone this weekend. But since it was a number one film, yeah, I think you still have a chance. All right. Well, we'll see you in the next one. Take Thanks care. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye.
None of you should go away. I just this said that so I could put our commercial in there. This is nonsense. Let's go. Oh, geez. Come on, Jay. Good hey, boy. listen. Listen, mm -hmm. don't cross me. Oh, thank you. Oh. You're giving oh, me plenty Lord. of bonus content for after the uh, after the out, uh, out, out music. Holy crap, you got it right. Thank you. 